Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this absolutely gorgeous Friday, November 16, 2018, and a little dog and I are heading to the big city of Austin, Texas for some more. Some big city excitement before global industrial civilization collapses in Austin, Texas. But before we go, I just want to, uh, for today's Chronicle of the Collapse, we're going to return to the same website we were at yesterday at gizmodo.com to look at another question of the day from Gizmodo asking the question, a very common question here in the collapse rabbit hole, what is the ideal number of humans on earth? So like they did yesterday, uh, they interview uh, a pretty good selection of uh, economists, geographers, conservationists, and population experts. So we are going... Now, of course, they only asked humans the question, what is the ideal number of humans on the planet? Of course, if they had asked any other one of our fellow earthlings we share the planet with, with the exception of our domestic animals and maybe rats and other vermin, uh, the answer, the ideal number of humans on planet Earth is zero humans on planet Earth is the ideal number of humans on the planet on the planet and we will get there uh, at some point but between now and then right up until the population of humans does reach the ideal number of zero we're gonna be having this debate and we're gonna start with Joe Bish Joe Bish is the director of issue advocacy for the Population Media Center. Take it away, Joe. <clears throat> Just arriving at an educated guess at ideal human population oversimplifies the puzzle because while population size sets the scale of human impact, it is not the sole determinant of the human relationship with Earth. Unlike other animals whose impact is generally limited by their appetites, humans have discretionary environmental impacts far and above our basic biological needs. This behavior is often lumped under the umbrella phrase of overconsumption but really includes an enormous number of resource extraction, production, and consumption decisions that occur around the clock at a worldwide scale of over seven and a half billion people. Given all of the factors that go into humanity's interactions with our natural world, we won't assert that there is some magic number to which we should hew. Rather, we would choose to improve the dynamics that le lead to a mind-boggling net addition of one and a half million people per week on this planet. Nine thousand more people each hour and every hour which the earth must support. By the time I finish reading this, 4,000 people will have been added to this planet, in other words. These factors include a lack of gender equality, poor or non-existent reproductive health services, lack of family planning, services and catastrophic lack of girls education in many parts of the world no honestly informed person will dispute that bio that biodiversity is already suffering horribly 
and is in danger of systemic collapse, improving the health, rights, and education of people already on this planet and thereby working to slow down and stop population growth is something we fully support for the health of every plant and animal species on the planet, including our own. Okay, let's listen to Bent Fleiberg, professor of the business school at the University of Oxford. Take it away, Professor Fleiberg. From an anthropocentric perspective, to calculate the Earth's ideal population size, one would first need to establish an ideal benchmark for what we think is a good life and calculate <coughs> the resources it takes to sustain that lifestyle. As a first approximation, let's take the French lifestyle as a benchmark. According to the Global Footprint Network's calculator, if all of humanity were to live like the French, we would need about two and a half planet Earths to sustain that lifestyle. Any lifestyle that cannot be universalized to the rest of humanity cannot be just. Every newborn should be able to enjoy their fair share of the world's resources. Thus, to ensure the ideal population size so that everyone could enjoy a comparable way of life, taking the French lifestyle as our benchmark, we would need to reduce the world population to about three billion people otherwise known as four and a half billion people less than today's population. So if instead we chose the lifestyle of people in the USA as the benchmark, then we would need to reduce the world population to 1.9 billion people. It is unclear, however, that the American lifestyle is any better than the French in terms of well-being. On the contrary, it looks like Europeans are in fact faring better than Americans. In other words, it seems that Americans are less efficient in living well ecologically. What this shows is that comparable or superior levels of well-being may be achieved spending less resources. Presumably, however, there will be a minimum ecological footprint to achieve a level of well-being we could consider ideal. So apart from reducing the world's population, there is a second way to bring about a situation in which all human beings could enjoy an equal share of the world's resources if we wanted to keep the world's human inhabitants at the current 7.6 billion people, then we would need to reduce our ecological footprints and live like people in India by either adopting a similar lifestyle or developing more ecological methods of sustaining our way of life. As a species, humans have come late, maybe too late, to the realization that the Earth's ideal population size depends on our lifestyle and ecological footprint and that all three need to be managed wisely to avoid environmental Armageddon. That should not keep us from trying to get the balance right between population size and ecological footprint, needless to say. If we do this, we may just be lucky enough to avoid the fate of becoming the species that, from an ecological perspective made its ideal population size zero.
which is which is exactly where we are taking our population to the ideal population of zero. It's only a matter of if, not when. Okay, let's listen to Dr. Bruce Dubold. He is a professor of geography uh, from McMaster University, blah, blah. All right, take it away. As the Earth's population has grown, there has been a long-running debate and commentary on what the Earth's optimal population size should be. Starting with Thomas Malthus in the 18th century, who wrote that population growth far outpaced the growth of the food supply, academics and commentators here debated whether the Earth can continue to support a growing population. In fact, Malthus was concerned that the world's population, less than one billion at his time, was already too large. Despite such dire predictions, we have found new ways to feed and support our population. More than likely, we have already surpassed some optimal, optimal population size or threshold. The question, however, is bedeviled by other related questions. Should all of the world's population have the same access in terms of quality and quantity to food? Should there be a more equitable standard of living? Will everyone have equal access to resources and equal opportunities? This is certainly not the case now, but determining the answers to these questions will determine how we answer whether there is an optimal population size. My little dog wants to reduce the optimal population of squirrels in Garfield, Texas to zero. Sancho, you stay over here now. Okay, we're now going to hear from Earl C. Ellis. A uh, professor of geography and environmental systems from University of Maryland. Okay, the question, how many people can Earth support, has been asked and answered many times. And Tony Van Leeuwenbach computed 13.4 billion people in 1679. Cesar Marchetti proposed 1,000 billion people in 1979. In 1994, Paul Ehrlich, who we'll hear from in a moment, stated that the present population of 5.5 billion has clearly exceeded the capacity of Earth to sustain it. Now, more than 7 billion people live on Earth and are generally, generally better fed, healthier, and living longer than at any time in human history. Rates of population growth peaked in the 1970s and the result of the demographic transition as more urbanized, better educated populations tend to have smaller families. Population will most likely peak in 2100 at about 11 billion. Yet per capita human demands for food, water, energy, and other environmental resources continue to grow as wealthier populations make greater demands on Earth's resources. The question of how many people Earth can support will continue to fascinate, but the most important question, to paraphrase demographer Joel Cohen, is how do we humans want to live on planet Earth? Do we want to transform our entire planet into engineered ecosystems designed to support only human beings? To live in towers eating vat meat powered by massive nuclear energy systems? If so, 
1,000 billion people might be possible. If it were somehow possible to go back to living as hunter-gatherers, perhaps only a few tens of millions, or in pre-industrial agrarian societies, maybe a few billion could live on this planet. But these are just fantasies at this point in history. The real question for the Anthropocene is how to move our societies towards creating and sustaining thriving societies that sustain both healthy, happy people and a healthy, non-human nature, leaving plenty of room for wild creatures to live and thrive in habitats free of human interference, though no small change in direction would be needed, such a planet is achievable now and can be even with 11 billion people. Hmm. Human societies have emerged as a global force of nature if and only if our societies make better futures our goal and cooperate together in achieving this, will we create and sustain the societies and non-human natures that we and future generations will desire to live in? And of course we have to hear from Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich, who was the very first interview on Collapse Chronicles. Take it away, Paul. Our research group has concluded two decades ago that with foreseeable technologies, an optimum population might be one and a half to two billion people. The idea was that the idea was that would be enough people to have big cities for those who like fine restaurants and opera, and few enough people to permit lots of wild lands for hunters and hermits. Overall, we thought that number might be long-term sustainable. Science Scientists have learned a lot more in the past decade about things like toxification of the planet, climate disruption, nuclear war, and so on that makes those numbers now seem optimistic. The one and a half to two billion seem optimistic as the population races past seven and a half billion economists still fail to realize that growth is the disease, not the cure for human problems, and that the most powerful nature in the world is now governed, and the most powerful nation in the world is now governed by moronic thugs working in any way they can to speed up the coming collapse uh, anyway good lord this goes on and on uh, okay I'm just going uh, <clears throat> we just have to skip ahead and let's see uh, let's check in with Paul's contention that economists still fail to realize that growth is the disease, not the cure for human problems. We're going to have to skip over John Hawks, and we're going to wind up with this hilarious quote from David Lamb. David Lamb is a professor of economics from the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. So what does economist David Lamb have to say about the ideal population? The world 
is projected to add another 4 billion people by 2100 with population probably leveling off after that at 11 or 12 billion, billion people. Rapid fertility decline has caused population growth rates to decline everywhere. Africa will be the only region with positive population growth by around 2050, and even Africa's population growth will probably be at low levels by 2100. Given the world's ability to absorb the extra 4 billion people that were added between 1960 and 2011 with rising standards of living all over the world, I, this economist, I am optimistic that the world can add another 4 billion people between now and 2100 with standards of living continuing to improve. One of many caveats to this is that we must solve the problem of climate change, a challenge that cannot be minimalized. But assuming that we do come up with solutions to climate change, a reasonable forecast is that world population will stabilize at about 12 billion people in a bit over 100 years. Let's say 2125. The demographic projections by economists, tricky as they are, are much easier than economic projections. But given past experience, my forecast is that living standards in 2025 will be at least as high as they are today, and they will be sustainable over time. All of this leads me to conclude that 12 billion people sounds like a good number for the world. If 12 billion people is where the world is headed, and if those 12 billion people are likely to have a reasonable and sustainable standard of living, I cannot think of an ethical or philosophical reason for thinking that the ideal population is anything less than 12 billion people. <clears throat> and you really can't add anything to that. Well, you can add four words to that, but uh, you'll have to leave that to that other channel. Uh, <laughs> I can't think of any, any reason, any reason, cannot think of any reason that the highest and best use of a planet is to see how many humans we can stuff on it. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up today's uh, chronicle of the collapse of uh, planet Earth and uh, head in to Austin, Texas while I still can to enjoy the waning days of global industrial civilization with about one million of my fellow clueless morons on this absolutely gorgeous day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. And I suggest you get out there and enjoy it while you still can. Bye, guys. Yes, did you get the population of squirrels down to zero in Garfield, Texas?